being said, we're going to have an awesome Sunday. Okay? Now listen, some of you all didn't have mamas to teach you right. Some of you didn't have daddies to teach you right. And you didn't have folks to show you the way. Okay? So what I'm going to do, we're not going to have a sermon here this morning. Because I've got to be honest with you. I'm just going to be real. I can't stand sermons. My attention span is like, I don't even know. It's so pathetic. My attention span is like, sorry, mom. My attention span is just so tiny. Like, like, you know, the first scripture, I'm like, that's great. I get it. But then like five scriptures into it, I have no idea what they're saying. And we know that you guys don't know either because you have that same dazed look on your face that <laughs> my husband will go home and he's like, they had no clue, right? And I'm like, yeah, because you had more than five scriptures and then no one knows what you're saying. So, um, so we don't have a scripture here this morning. So if you came prepared to take notes, you know, you Bible scholars, I apologize because you're not going to get that. But you might want to take out a pen and paper because some of you didn't have moms and dads or men and women in the faith to show you the right way. And so it was my determination to walk here today to show you the way and to show you how we walk and how we live this life. And so that's the only reason why I stand here this morning is to be a signpost to you, to show you the right way to go. Those of you that may not know, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Um, you know, in life, every one of you, every one of us in here have had moments of impact. I wear my glasses today so I can actually see your faces. Sorry, like I can actually see you today. Uh, every one of us have had moments of impact. And the word impact is something that comes at you like a collision. And it's made to make a great force and to change the structure of things. And so it's up to you and I how we let those things impact us. I've had many moments of impact in my life. I uh, can think of them. You know, many of you can. I can think of moments where people said things that I remember being 17 years old, being told by somebody that I was no good and that I could never be loved. And uh, to this day, I can still feel the impact of that. And you, and you, and you, and you out there, you may have had moments where your parents weren't really good to you, or people that you loved and you put trust in said things that they maybe didn't even know that impacted your life. And the shift happened inside of you, and it altered the course of your destiny. And it changed you from the course and the path that God has called you to. And so years ago, I've had lots of impacts. I've been told things by people that I loved and trusted that I wasn't enough to stand up here. I've been told the only reason why I stood up here, I don't even know what people think. Hey, listen, <laughs> there ain't nobody smart that wants to go into ministry because they think it's going to be a glamorous life. <laughs> if anybody ever thought that, they were a blaming fool. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> so nobody whatever, with any kind of mind, would pick up this cross without a reason, okay? Just letting you know. So I can think throughout my life of the different impacts that have tried to shift me and change me into a different person. And my husband and I have stood strong and decided that there would be nothing or no one. You don't understand, you think you're coming into a church building. This is not a church building. And I don't understand, maybe some of you come here and you think that you're just part of a church. And that's great, because we do church picnics and, you know, we do fun things for kids and we do great stuff. But really, why we come here every Sunday has nothing to do with this church. This church is only a vehicle for us to change lives. And not only to change lives, but see, about 10 years ago, my husband knew that we would pastor this church. And he never looked at pastoring in this church as an ultimate goal or any kind of goal. But he looked at breaking a spirit that resides over a region. And that region is called the Midwest, the St. Louis area. 
There's a spirit that has attached itself to our region. Churches get to be about 300 and they split. Churches get to be about 300, the pastor goes off and has an affair and does something crazy. Churches get to a certain point. Churches that were made to make an impact. Now there's churches that are big. And that's okay. And there's churches that'll preach you a nice little gospel every morning. And make you feel good about yourself. But there's not many men that will stand up in a pulpit and say, I still believe. And have the audacity to walk it out. And thank you. And so that is our mandate. Our mandate is to shift a generation in our region. And that is the only reason why Gateway Family Church stands here today. That's it. Is to shift a region. And I don't know when it's going to happen. It may happen in my lifetime. It may happen in my children's lifetime. But it will happen. And we and us are forerunners of that in this region. Because there's not many. There's large churches in St. Louis. There was a man of God in St. Louis. That healings and miracles used to happen. His daddy got cancer. He prayed for that man. He swapped the floor and paced the floor for his daddy. His daddy died. His daddy died way before his time. And that man stood in his pulpit the next Sunday and said, no more will we cry out for healings and miracles. No more. I believed a lie. It's still a big church in St. Louis. It's a really big church. He no more lets God move in that way. And I am telling you that that will never happen. I am telling you that cancers will fall off at this altar. And I am telling you that I will prophesy life to more people. And I am telling you that my husband will raise the dead and we will go to the nations and we'll go to Honduras and we'll pray for the sick. And I'm telling you that our school, see, I'm not enough. I'm a big enough woman to admit when I jacked up, okay? So we have a school here called Gateway Legacy Christian Academy. And for a long time, because I had seen my siblings get hurt in a school that was very one way, was very Baptist, and if you weren't Baptist, you were junk. I thought that was way wrong. So I wanted a school that would be all things and love all kids. Okay? Wait, don't name me yet. Because that's my big mess up, okay? Okay. So what I did is, out of a good heart, I made a really dumb thing. And I decided that, you know, we weren't going to teach our kids to lay hands on the sick at school, and they weren't going to prophesy at school. And we could do that in church, but... That's changed. And so Gateway Legacy Christian Academy, our fearless principal, has decided that that will be different. That it will be the training ground to the nation. And so if you're new here, I want to tell you a story of my latest moment of impact. My son, Gregory Kenneth Morris on the second, let me tell you, he's the sweetest kid. I'm his mom and I know you all think your kids are great. Now listen, I'm a realist, okay, for real. Like I know that Judah is a hot mess. I can admit that. You walk in my house any moment of the day, he's probably naked. And really proud of it. And I'm sorry to those that walk in on a regular basis. And he could be dancing in all his glory <laughs> and wanting you to laugh at him. Now, my Gregory, never in 13 years did that boy ever raise his voice to his mom. Never rolled his eyes at his dad. Never had an attitude. The biggest thing Gregory, the biggest offense Gregory ever did, I am a rockin' awesome cook. Everyone loves my food. Everyone. Like, Everyone loves it, except for Gregory. And so I would make, you know, like 
fettuccine alfredo and Caesar salad and like garlic bread and you know, like really good for, for dinners. And he'd look at me and go, Nan, can I go to, I mean, mom, can I go to Nan's house and have some fish sticks? <laughs> now listen, I love my mother and we're gonna pretend she's not here. My mother will make fish sticks black and crunchy, but yet somehow soggy at the same time. And I don't know how that's possible, mama, but you do it. <laughs> so Gregory, if you don't know him, he is the kindest, gentlest boy. He's playing on Xbox and, you know, I don't know, Jeff and Angie here. You know, Jeff and Angie are like, you know, Jeff's this awesome dad and he's like, you know, got baby, can read for Samuel and doing all these great things. And Greg's like, yeah, but we're teaching our kids how to kick butt in video games, you know. So I'm sorry, like, we love Jesus and we rock out to Jesus, but then sometimes we shoot things. So I'm sorry in our house. So Gregory's the kind of kid that he's up there, he's got, we went and bought some new furniture and got a 60 inch TV. We put it in our kid's room, who does that? So he has a 60 inch TV and uh, playing video games. And I could hear him, you know, talking to kids in Florida that are cussing and he's like, man, you know what, that's just not cool. I don't think I really want to listen to you. And he'd just turn off his headset and leave. He had friends, we were probably in here today, he'd mute you all the time when you were talking smack. Because he's just a really good kid. He's probably the kindest person I've ever met. Like, there's really, like, like I can't even tell you. Like, now he would yell at his sister every now and then, you know. For no reason at all. No reason at all. So, it's Christmas. We had an awesome Christmas. And my mom and dad have taken all their grandkids at one time or another to Florida. Ike's been, everybody's been, they all go to Florida. And so it was Gregory and Bella's turn to go to Florida. So they go to Florida and they're just having an awesome time. And uh, he comes back and it's our first day back to school. He walks in and he's like, mom, I don't feel good. And I'm like, dude, you've been off school for three weeks. You're waking up at seven in the morning. Of course you don't feel good. I don't feel good. And he's like, no mom, I just really don't feel good. And uh, I made him go to school that day and he came home and he was crabby at night. And I had no clue why he was crabby and he was just being like out of sorts. And I said, dude, come in here and lay in bed with me. And he came in and he was on fire. And uh, took him to the emergency room and sent him home, said it was a virus, bugs are going around. And uh, took him back again. And his daddy took him over there and uh, I brought the kids to school and came back home and picked up my mom and we we're gonna go over to the hospital and see how he's doing. And we get there in the room and they're like, hey, it's mono. And so we're like, so relieved it's mono. And uh, all of a sudden, about five minutes later, this team of people rush in the room. And they put him on his gurney and they just start freaking out. And all of a sudden, when you're high priority in an emergency room, never a good thing, right? And they start looking at his legs and they start talking about leukemia to me. I go in the hall, I call my sister and I'm like, this can't be. And she's like, oh, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, yeah, they're just crazy because doctors see all the worst things, it's fine, okay? So, all of a sudden, they're like, we can't take him to a regular room, we're gonna take him to the ICU unit. And all of a sudden, I don't know where I'm at or how I got there. And uh, I'm like, it's just mono, it's just mono. And I'm kind of mad and I'm angry because they had sent him home four days earlier. So every doctor that talks to me, I'm like, well, yeah, he's so stinking sick because your idiot doctor sent him home. Of course he's sick. You know, he's dehydrated, just give him some fluid. And they're walking us to the emergency, to the ICU. And the nurse looks at me and goes, ma'am, his cells are eating each other. And there are so few of the one cells, we can't even find him in his bone marrow. And I'll never forget that corridor that I'm standing in. I take my kid into a room, and they begin doing all these things to him that I can't even believe. And days go by, and they tell us that he has a rare bone disorder caused by mono that came in and ate out his bone marrow. And he got sick at Christmas time, a week before Christmas, and he got mono, and that's what caused this. They think. But then they say, but there's also this genetic form, and all your other kids might have it too. But it takes eight weeks to get back to genetic testing. So I walked in here every Sunday morning smiling at y'all. Now I know that all five of my kids would have this horrible disease, crying out to God, not really understanding. And uh, came back, it's not genetic, thank you, Jesus. Gregory got better, and they tell us a bone marrow transplant is the only way. And uh, we listened to what they said and took educated decisions, still trusting in God the whole time. 
And uh, that was January 7th. And July 12th at 9.30 in the evening, my baby went to be with Jesus. And um, so many of you have been so incredible. But I know there's lots of questions of why. And bad things happen and no one really knows. And people give ridiculous answers. And I just got to tell you. In life, people tell you really crappy things. Excuse me. Just things that are just garbage. Okay? They tell you things like, God needed another angel up in heaven. He finally graduated and got his wings. Jesus needed a flower in the garden. That is a line of garbage. Because I can tell you exactly why this happened. It's not because we didn't pray enough. Not because we didn't believe enough. But is it an injustice that was brought against our region and our area? It was an injustice that the enemy brought against our area. Not, it's not against, so you don't understand, and I don't think that some of you understand what Pastor Greg has taken on as a mandate. Sometimes you just don't get it. You don't get it. Like if you go to a church where you have a pastor who doesn't have a mandate, you should get out of there. If you go to church just to go to church and have some Bible studies and stuff, leave it's not worth it if you're not at a place where someone has a mandate to change a generation and to say is there not a cause in our area is there not a cause is there not something greater than me that i'm gonna believe in because i'm telling you is there not a cause and i will stand up and i will fight so that is why. So don't, don't listen to a line of garbage of like, God just needed Gregory to be his little hero up in heaven. That is a line of garbage. The enemy came in and he stole something that was rightfully ours. And it is an injustice that has happened. So my baby, through all this, he was scared, never complained in the hospital with him and they tell us chemotherapy is the only thing that gets rid of this it'll put it into remission and we can then do the transplant because without this HLH going into remission the fatality rate is three weeks 100% so we have no choice because our baby's ferritin level a ferritin level is a level of iron in your blood and you die at 5,000 my baby's level was 14,000 when I took him into the hospital so they come to me and they say, we have to do this or he may not make it another day or two. His ferritin level is going to continue to go up. His liver and spleen are going to rupture and he will die. I say, okay, God, I don't get it, but okay. So his daddy drives him over to treatments. And if you don't know my husband, my husband despises cancer. And so we're sitting in the cancer ward because hematology, oncology is on the same floor. My husband has to go there every single week. My baby's in the hospital and his hair started falling out. And he had like really cool little hair, you know what I mean? It was cool. Looks at me and goes, Mom, I think it's time to call Child Life Services to come in and get rid of it. I had to stand there and watch him shave his head. He didn't cry. He didn't flinch. He's like, Mom, it's okay. It'll grow back. It's just hair. <sighs> I watched him, he wanted to come back to school and see now he has a compromised immune system so he couldn't come to church and he couldn't come to school because he'd get sick. And they said if he gets sick, it's gonna be two to three weeks in the hospital and anything that he gets, it could be serious. So me being a psychopathic mom, I kept him home. And he wanted to come to school that day. It was right before transplant. And I knew he was embarrassed because he was on steroids and his face had swollen. He'd hold his head down a lot. But he wanted to come so bad and see his friends. And uh, he walked in those doors like a champ. Gets us to the transplant. They told us he has a virus right before transplant. I emailed him a million times, will it stop or mess up the transplant? And they told me no. They told me it would be okay. Met with the top doctor of Children's Hospital. I emailed him a hundred times and I said, will this virus mess up my baby's transplant? He looked at me and said no. I take him in, they start all the therapy to kill his immune system, he does a champ. Two days after his immune system's gone, they come in with a report and they go, the virus is raising up in his body. And uh, he's got this virus. 
And I said, well, I know you told me that he had the virus when we got in. It's going to be okay, right? And there's a look that they give you. And when you're in the hall, if you've been at the doctor's offices, they give you a look. And my husband and I have been on many a deathbeds, and we know the look that they're giving families. We know it. We get it. We're not novices at this. And so we fought every single day. Lady looked at me and she goes, well, this virus will probably, the medicine we're giving to get rid of the virus will probably stop his engraftment. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? They don't really do anything. And um, laying in bed one night, when Gregory first got home from the hospital, I looked at him and I told him, baby, mommy's just going to ask one thing. I go, I need you to fight. No matter what we're going to face in the days ahead, I need you to stay strong and I need you to fight. He goes, okay, mom, I promise. Last week, it was two Sunday nights ago, I was at the hospital, I was getting ready to come here, and I was in his room, and he looked at me, and he goes, Mom, I'm really tired of fighting. And I go, I know, man, you are, but we're gonna, it's almost done, man, we're going to be home. He said, Mom, I'm just really tired, and I don't feel good anymore. I go, I know, bud. It's going to be okay, right? I walk out. I'm getting ready to leave to come to church, and the lady looks at me, the nurse, and she goes, are you leaving? And I said, yeah, I'm going to go get my other babies and go to church tonight. She's like, you may not want to leave. We're getting ready to, uh, his kidneys have shut down from the medicines that we've gave him. His kidneys didn't shut down from any other thing than that. And uh, we're going to have to put him on dialysis and we're going to have to intubate him. So you probably don't want to leave. So I go in and I get to be the one to tell my kid what's going to happen. Because the doctor was coming and I go, no, please don't. Just, just let me do it. I go in and I say, man, guess what? You know, Lily... How she has that thing out of her neck. That's my niece. And they do dialysis on her. You get one just like Lily. And they're going to knock you out. And uh, put that in. And then we're going to like work on your kidneys. And it's going to be okay. And he looks at me and he's like, Mom, if I don't do it, am I going to die? I go, no, man. No, man. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, okay, Mom, if they're going to do it, tell them to get in here and get it done. I'm not going to wait for them. So I go out and tell the guy, my son says, if you don't get in there and get it done, you're not doing it at all, so you better get in there and get it done. And uh, another moment of impact, I walk out, the doctor looks at me and goes, I'm sorry that I'm the one that will take his voice from you. That moment, I knew what he meant. And uh, it's a moment of impact that the enemy tries to root inside of me to change the course of history. It's nothing more than that. So my son, this awesome kid that he is, Gregory, I'm like telling him about this, sorry. So he has this physical therapist named Clay. And Clay is like the coolest guy ever. He comes in every day and he does physical therapy with Gregory and he, everyone loves Gregory. Gregory's like the hero of the floor. All the nurses come in and tell me that he is just the best thing ever. All the doctors love him. Everybody loves him because he's just like the sweetest kid ever. And Clay is like, man, I love you. He, Kay is like, Clay is like kissing him and hugging him and telling him, I just love you, man. You're the best. And he does therapy with him every day. And Clay is like, Gregory, you're my hero, man. You're just... Every day you've been sick and not feeling good. Clay would make him do the bike. Gregory would be so tired. He'd get on this bike for 30 minutes, dragging his little legs, but he would do it just because he knew that's what needed to be done. And Clay goes, you're my hero. And uh, Clay leaves the room and Gregory goes, Mom, I just don't like that. And I go, why, man? He goes, because it's God in me. It's not me. And people shouldn't call me a hero because Jesus is the only hero. Um, another moment of impact it's a Monday night, and Greg and Gregory are over at Children's Hospital having therapy, and I'm making dinner. And Gregory comes in, and uh, Greg, you know, we tried to make all these really crummy moments, really happy moments. And Greg comes in and goes, guess what? Gregory gets anything he wants. And I'm like, yeah, I know, because I've spent all of our household fortune buying him every video game for the past five months. Of course he gets whatever he wants. I bought him every t-shirt known to mankind. I, you know did everything. Like, we're mail ordering stuff. Like, I'm broke for the next hundred years. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, he goes, Gregory gets to make a wish. And my heart hit my feet. And I go, what are you talking about? 
He goes, well, the Make-A-Wish Foundation contacted us. And because HLH is a life-threatening disease, Gregory gets whatever he wants. And as a mom, you never want to hear that your kid's the Make-A-Wish, you know? That's like really crummy, you know? That's like, who wants that? And so I'm like, awesome, bud. I run upstairs and I get on the website and I'm like, are these kids still alive that got wishes? Like, are they still here? <laughs> Freaking out. And uh, so the really cool part about that is we, you know, for days, we're like, bud, what do you want? You know, one kid got like Harvard education paid for. Cars, boats, anything. Anything that they'd ever want. And uh, first of all, he says to me, he goes, well, mom, you know, I'm really blessed. And you get me whatever I want. And I go on vacations. I just went to Florida. You take me on trips every single year. Nan and Papa take care of me, mom. I don't need any of that. He goes, so why don't you take one of the kids that come in on the bus that don't get anything? And they told me that I could give my wish away. He goes, can I just give it away? And me, psycho mother, not letting my kid like be the hand of God, I'm like, no, you will keep your wish. <laughs> you will keep your wish. <laughs> so, after days and weeks, you know, we talk about all the time, man, what's your wish? This is so cool. What's your wish? What's your wish? And uh, he goes, mom, what I really want is I really want a gym for our school. And I want to see foreign exchange students come here and be a part of the gym. And I really want, see, when you're immune suppressed, um, we couldn't take in places because they don't clean things right. It's not really about being around people, but it's about like cleaning stuff right. So if you go to a place to play video games, have you seen how filthy and nasty those video games are? Make your kids wash their hands because it's nasty, okay? So he couldn't go do any of that stuff because he was immune compromised. And he goes, I just really want a place where like once a month we can clean it really good and kids that can't get out and do stuff can come. And he goes, and mom, and then when they come, we can tell them about Jesus and get their family saved. And so that's my kid's wish. And Greg and I as pastors, Hap and Sandy as pastors, never ask you for anything. Today, that's going to change. First of all, I'm asking you that if you were in this building and you're attached to us and you share our heart, I am asking that you lay hands on the sick. I am asking that you prophesy life into the nations. I'm asking you that you would pour into others more than you've ever poured into anyone. That you would help us run this race, not about a church, not about a building, but about a movement that's going to shape and change our area. And I am asking you, we're going to today, in a few minutes, we're going to take an offering. And every bit of that offering today is going to go into a new building fund. And we're going to build, we need about $3 million. And we're going to get it. Like, not in 10 years. Like, I'm going to get it this year. Like, you can go with me or not. But like, I'm going to get it this year. Because I am that psycho. You may not know how crazy I am. I am that crazy. Some of you know how crazy. Sarah knows how crazy I am. A few people know how crazy I am. Um. And I want to raise a banner for our area. You may say, who cares about a gym? But see, if you have really cool stuff, kids come to it. Okay? And I don't mean like a stinking metal building with like an old dirty basketball in it, okay? I mean like state-of-the-art rocking stuff, okay? Like really cool. Like awesome. And I want to change our area and our region. And I want to prophesy and run like never before. Another thing that I'm asking you to do. See, some of you, I mean, you know Greg, but you don't know him. I know him. I know him that in 20 years of knowing him, and listen, I can be a hot mess. Right, Dad? I mean, I'm pretty, I mean, I'm nice, right? 
Why did that get so quiet in here? I mean, I really am. Okay, Candace, am I crazy? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Phil's like, oh yeah. She'd be nuts. <laughs> Phil has to work with me every single day. Um, he's never once raised his voice to me. He's never dishonored his children. That man, from May 6th to July 12th, spent every night at his son's bedside, never leaving. He fasted for about 30 days and didn't eat. Not only did he uh, stay there, but he'd get about one or two hours of sleep every single night because he'd stay at the end of his son's bed and prophesy life. You don't know him, but I do. Every night, he comes home. He spends a lot of time with his babies, loving them and taking care of them. He goes to our basement, and he paces the floor, whether he has a sermon or not, whether he's preaching that week or not. He paces the floor and cries out to God for our region and our area to be changed and for lives to be different and for your lives to be different. And this whole thing is nothing more than an onslaught against the plans and purposes for our region and for our area. And so we are sad, of course, and there will forever be a hole in my heart that will never go away. But I got to tell you, I don't want you all crying, and uh, we're not going to come in here and have a spirit of heaviness every single week, okay? We're going to be happy. Like, we're still going to lay hands on the sick, we're going to prophesy, we're going to cast out devils, we're going to get lives straight. And I refuse to let this make an impact in my heart or in yours. I refuse. I absolutely, positively refuse. So for the last seven months, I've uh, been walking my four children through this process. And the night Greg was at the hospital, I didn't want to go. All the family was there, and I was home with my other babies. And uh, the night that it happened, my Benjamin, he's eight years old, he's crying, screaming. Daughter Isabella is crying because they don't get it. Because we teach them to walk out their faith out loud. And uh, I sat down with them and I explained this story like I'm telling to you. And so that is why I'm sitting down with you all today and explaining to you that our God is good. And I don't mean he's good. I mean, you know, good. Good is like, okay, whatever. He is magnificent, all wonderful, all powerful, all absolutely everything. Was it his will to see Gregory healed? Absolutely. Is there human error? Yes. But is God's plan for good? Yes. Absolutely. Of course, without a doubt, beyond all reason. And we can choose to let this shift us and change us. Or we can choose to be the men and women that God's called you to be. And so for the first time, you know, I don't really like, people call me pastor, Melissa. I don't really like it because like, listen, if you get called, like if you're in leadership and you get called pastor, that means like God's going to judge you more greatly. So I'm just like, it's a selfish reason for real. I don't like it. And uh, I'm like, no, on judgment day, it's going to get bad if you say that. Don't say that to me. Um. But probably this weekend, like never before, I got so many, I mean, I haven't gone through my Facebook messages yet. And one person who I've known for years, they don't go to this church, that's why I'm saying it. She's loved God her whole life. And she sends me a message and she's like, I am shaking my fist at heaven right now. And I'm angry and I am ticked off because I love you and Greg so much. And I've watched how you've raised your kids and I am shaking my fist in heaven. And I have to respond to her that God is good. And I'm not mad, and I don't question. A great man of God, Bill Johnson, his daddy. Bill Johnson, if you don't know him, he has a church in Redding, California. 
and they have seen one year in their healing rooms 200 miracles of cancer document I don't, I don't just say like you know you can say like I come up here and I had a bad back and I feel better fine whatever that's great Jesus touched you great I mean like I had a tumor on my arm and it fell off and it's gone okay like I'm talking like real deal stuff right his daddy died of cancer Bill's a sixth generation preacher man of God and it's okay for a man to die when they're old but not that way if you've ever watched it it's a terrible thing and he stood up the next Sunday morning and preached before his church and he said something that I've repeated a million times and I repeat it again today and it goes like this I will never lay the goodness of God on the altar of my own reasoning I will never lay the goodness of God on the altar of my own reasoning yesterday all of our family was over and I love you all and you guys mean the world to me and I had some people asking me why and they don't understand and I find myself in a moment of being a mom so if I'm a uh, younger than you all I'm sorry I'm gonna be your mom today never lay the goodness of God on the altar of your own reasoning and never let instances or things that happen to you impact you and change your destiny because see life is too short life is way too short to not fill out the plans and purposes of God in your life that is the only reason why we're here is to be an extension in the hand of God and so the enemy from the garden, can't you see? Like, do people read the Bible? Do you all read the Bible? I'm just asking you. Like, like okay, listen. My husband comes to church, and he thinks this is funny. I tell him all the time. I'm not, I mean, I know all of you, but there's probably some. I don't know. Okay. He's under the illusion that everybody's reading the Bible like five hours a day and praying. <laughs> and that they know all the stories. My mom's always like, and you know that story. And I know like 80% of you are going, no, I don't. Because... Maybe it's just me, but that, remember that attention span I was talking about that's really tiny? Maybe I'm just preaching to myself. Um, what, Melina? <laughs> so, in the Bible, as I was talking about, I don't know what was I talking about. It left, it left me. For the first time, it left me. What? Tell me. You don't even know. What? I didn't say anything about a garden. Oh, I did? I'm like, please don't tell me I'm singing that in the garden song. <laughs> Good Lord, Dave. Really? In the garden. In the garden. Really? I'm sorry. One day next week, you'll pay for that one. No. We love Pastor Dave, but Pastor Dave's awesome. But it's kind of mine and Greg's mission in life is to drive him crazy and antagonize him just a little bit just a little bit um, I'm just telling you maybe you haven't someone tell you and show you the way and maybe there's times that you got angry at God and mad at God and maybe there's times that you let things shape you and impact you and take you off course and change the person that you really are and I'm just asking you that today you would decide to shift and be the man and woman that God has called you to be and walk out your destiny and pray for the sick lay hands on them even when they don't get healed and if they don't get healed go to the next one so Bill Johnson as I was talking sorry Bill Johnson his daddy died didn't understand it He's had hundreds of miracles in his healing rooms, but his son, who just took over the church's death. Greg went to Reading to meet them and see their healing rooms. The pastor over their healing rooms, his daughter, has multiple sclerosis, but it's not like the little kind. It's the kind that she's in a wheelchair and her body is wracked in pain and she can't even talk anymore and she's nine years old and she lays in bed every night and cries and screams. 
And he says, I keep doing what I do because tomorrow could be the day. So don't stop. If you pray for 100 and they don't get healed, so what? Pray for 101, they probably will. And if there's ever a mistake, it's with us. It's with our humanness. Our earth suit that kind of jacks things up every now and then. It's never with God. It's never his goodness that we should lay on the altar. Never. So please, I'm begging you for me. For my son. I'm asking that we would pack out this church like never before. I'm asking that we would stand behind Pastor Greg more than ever before. I'm asking if he tells you to invite someone to church next week, like, go do it, okay? Like, he really thinks that you are. Like, he thinks when he tells you to go pray for somebody, he's under the illusion that you're like going to Denny's and doing it. So just for crying out loud, would you just do it? Um, but I'm just asking that we would change the world. And I want you to walk in here and don't be sad, okay? Like, I don't want this to be a place of sadness. It's the last thing I want. Because what the enemy wants is to put a spirit of sadness in here. And what it'll do, it'll just dry the thing up. And it'll take us years to rebuild it. And I don't want to do that. I'm a tired old woman. <laughs> and I have gray hair. You don't see it, but like, I cover it up well. And uh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to go back and move forward. So I'm just asking that you all would stand with us and change our world. Everyone's emailed me and Facebooked me and said, what can I do? My response to everyone, please help me change the world. Because see, there's lots of good churches. And there's lots of churches that'll teach you how to have a better relationship. Isn't that fun? How to like, you know, have a great married life. And there's places that'll teach you just good things. It's not bad. I'm not saying that it's bad. Those are all good things. And they're called to that. You know, there's places that, uh, there's people that'll go to those kinds of churches that would never step in here. And that's cool. That's okay. Like, I don't have any issue with that. But we're a little bit different kind of people here. And we're called to something different. We're called to change the world. The only thing that's going to bring change to our world is the healing power of God. That's it. It's it. That people know that they can come to God and then he heals them and that he loves them and he wants to see them free and he doesn't want them to live in the bondage that they've lived in and they don't have to go to church on Sunday and smile and go home to the same miserable, terrible life that they lived before that they can move forward. That's the plan here is to have a mandate over our region to change our region. So today we're going to take an offering, like I said, every single bit's going to go into our new building fund. And we need $3 million. So if you know somebody that has a lot of money, <laughs> call them. Tell them how cute my kid is. Tell them how great he is. And that he needs a gym. And get some money from him. And if they got some money in their pockets, like shake them a little and get it out of them. Okay? Like normally, I'm like, God will provide. But no, we have to go, like, go get some money. Okay? Like really. Um, so we're going to take an offering and then we're going to pray in just a second. I would like my three brothers to come up here with me. Don't you have more than that, Tony? Really? Don't get nervous. I'm not going to make you do anything crazy. I'm going to tell you, these are three awesome men of God right here. And, uh... My brother Herm, got to tell you. I mean, I love you all. And Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you. I'm sorry. Like, everyone that loves me, I'm sorry. Um... There's probably no greater person that got me through what I've gone through 
in the last seven months. I have about a million text messages for my big brother every day, encouraging me not to give up and encouraging me to stand strong and telling me that God loves me and that it's going to be okay. And I love you, man. I love you more. But I can never tell you. You've helped me through. I just don't know. I lay in bed at night. I read your text messages. But I love you. I'm eternally grateful. My other two brothers stood at my husband's side and prayed life into my baby for two minutes but for hours Steve and Amy you don't know how they know how to pray um, for the first time I mean I try to tell you like okay like Kim Clement okay is calling us and praying for us okay Kim like last night awesome man of God did a show dedicated it to Gregory prayed for Greg and I prayed for all of us okay that's awesome okay Pastor Parsley called us, prayed for Gregory over the phone. Pastor Parsley text messaged me constantly. Awesome man of God. Uh, Lloyd Bustard, Prophet Dixon, great man of God. I got to tell you that, like, I'm comparing you to, like, the greatest. Because there's no other person or persons that can pray like you two. And every time they'd walk into my baby's room, I'd love him, I'd take care of him, and pray heaven into that room. More than great men of God that I could tell you. I could feel God moving and God changing. I just want to thank you for standing with me, loving me, and more than that, loving my baby. Uncle Tone is the greatest uncle in the world. And he stood there for hours, him and Lisa, prophesying life. David, get up here. What are you doing? Nick's already up here. Super C, get your butt up here. This man has uh, loved my boy from the time he was little. I'm going to let you all in on a family secret. There's this great family secret that uh, my baby was born. And Greg and I have dark hair, right? And dark eyes. The day he came out, he had blonde hair and blue eyes. And the only blonde-headed person in the room with blue eyes is Craig. <laughs> and everyone's like, really? <laughs> so it's been our family joke. But I, what I want... Then I need my granddaddy up here. My granddaddy prophesied life. Help him up here, guys. My granddaddy, there's not a day that goes by that he didn't pace the floor and cry out to God for my baby. I love you, granddaddy. And then last, but most certainly, not least, it's my daddy. Now, y'all may think this is crazy. Maybe it is. But my daddy was in the delivery room when Gregory was born. And my daddy cut the umbilical cord. Brought life to my boy. And um, it's been a good papa. It's been the best. Taking my baby fishing. Done everything he can do. And uh, I would like my daddy and papa to come up here. Papa's been a good papa. Took my boy fishing the day before he went to the hospital. And so, on this stage with me are great men of God that I value 
more than anything. And there's a million of you that have been so good. Lisa, I got to tell you, there wasn't a morning that went by that around 6 a.m., Lisa didn't send me a text message saying, how's our boy today? Bill and Lisa have stood with us undying and unwavering. Bill prophesied life into my baby. Bill, I'd like for you to come up here. I don't know where Al is. Is Al here? Is Al here or is he upstairs? Okay. Kenny and Don have meant more to Greg than I could ever tell you. And I'd like for you guys to come up here. My husband honors you and looks at you as his most faithful friends. Ron, best armor bearer in the world, I want you to come up here. Pastor Dave, where did he go? Well, good, I wanted you to come up here. You can put the guitar down, though. So what I want is I'm going to pray. I'd like for them to pray, but I don't want to put them on the spot. Well, I'm going to put my brother on the spot, Stevie. He's going to get on the spot. And what we're going to pray today is that the moments of impact that have shifted your life and altered your destiny and changed you. Wait a heck of a minute. Get up here. Brian, you're my brother, man. Get up here. What am I, like, doing? I'm like in a foggy daze. I love you, man. So what I want is we're going to pray that all those moments that the enemy sent as an onslaught to shift your life and change you from your destiny will be broken in your life. Okay, that's what I want. That's my greatest prayer today, is that those moments of impact, some of you were hurt as kids and it shifted your entire destiny. Some of you, you had husbands and wives that told you you were no good and it changed you for forever. Some of you had deaths in your family that were wrong and that were unjustice and it made you angry at God and mad and you didn't understand. Some of you had opportunities that you thought were so certain that God was gonna take you into and it didn't happen. And you threw your fist up at God and said, why? And that's the plan. You see, whenever we get mad at someone in church and all of a sudden we leave because we're ticked and we grow bitterness at church, 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 you get bitter, you get mad. All those things, everything in life, it's not just, life isn't just like happenstances. Life is to shift you from being the man and woman that God has called you to be. And so all those moments of impact there's a lot of impact in this room. And so the greatest thing that we can do is to take what has hit us and shaped us and take those knives and those swords that the enemy has pierced our heart and turn them around and use them as a sword to bring glory to the kingdom of God. So, my brother, one of the most awesome mans of God, man of God that I know, you don't understand, like the dude knows how to pray. One day he's going to uh, preach to the nations, he just doesn't know it yet. I've got to tell you, I'm a very picky person. And I wouldn't let just anybody stand up here and pray over you, because I love you and I care about you. And I wouldn't let anyone's words go over your life, but I value his. And uh, so he's going to pray that the impact that the enemy has brought into your lives to shift you and alter you from your destiny will be broken over your life. And anybody else, anybody else that feels that they want to pray, you're more than welcome to take the microphone. Like, like it's an important moment. So like if you want to pray, Pastor Dave, if you want to pray, Tony, if you want to pray, whoever, Don, whoever, like just take the microphone and pray. And uh, whoever ends up with the microphone bill, whoever ends up with it, you can take the offering. And uh, we're going to see impact that the enemy has brought against the people of God. 
the impact. Because can you imagine if all of us lived impact free, walking at our destiny? Can you imagine what this place would be? Because I can't do it alone. It's up to you. I need you. Greg can't do it alone. So we need you. So I need you free from the impact of Satan so you can walk out the plans of God, okay? Here's what I want us to do. I want us to take your hand. We are forgiven. We're blood bought. The blood of Jesus is so strong. All of our failures, all of our things we've done wrong in our life, if you've asked forgiveness, they're gone. You are new, you're righteous in Jesus. So because of that, we can stand here righteous, holy. We have a holy God. He is so holy and he's so good and he loves all of us so much. So because of that, we can pray right now in the name of Jesus and things will happen. Things will be broken in Jesus' name. So Father, how good you are. We love you so very much. We come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you so much, my God, for your precious Holy Spirit. I pray over your church right now. I pray that in Jesus' name, Father God, things that, things that have been bothering us, things that have been just on us, Father God, we shake them off in Jesus' name. And we say in Jesus' name, Father God, our life will go forth in the name of Jesus and we'll be a light to the nations. Father, Gregory was a light. Father God, I love that young man. <laughs> I won't cry, but you know what? That boy, he smiled, and right now he's with you smiling. And Father God, for that, we are going to go forth strong in the name of Jesus, Father God. Everywhere we go, every place we go, Father God, where we drive, who we talk to, in the forefront of our mind, it's going to be kingdom business. And when that happens, Father God, the nations will be changed. Father God, this nation will be changed in the mighty name of Jesus. Because all things are possible to them that believe. And Father God, we believe and we trust in you. You are our God. You are our King, Father God. Father God, the feelings we have right now, we just put them up on the altar. And we ask you for your mercy and your grace and your peace, Father God, to flow into this room. And Father, with you, there is joy unspeakable. Joy unspeakable in the mighty name of Jesus. So Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your saving power and your grace and your mercy and your love. And Father God, I ask you to anoint Melissa. And I ask you to anoint Greg, Father God, in Jesus' name. That Father God, a mantle upon, Father God, none like it. Father God, you are well able to bless them, to be with them, to help them in everything they have to do. We love you and we thank you, thank you, thank you for your kindness and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, I like just, can we just take a minute and, and love on Mollus? I don't know another mom that could have stood in here and did what she did. I don't know another person that could have stood here and did what she did today. Come on, guys. You guys can do better than that. Come on. Come on. I watch football, but mostly you get more excited. Come on. For those of you who don't know, we're associated with Pastor Parsley out of Columbus, Ohio. Went to Bible College there. He's been here and preached. And th this is why I, th I respect my sister more than words. His father, who was over 80 years of age, passed away. Sunday morning rolls around. I, every Monday I make a, try to make a point to watch what's going on in World Harvest. And uh, pastor's nowhere to be found. The elders are there. They're doing the service. Nobody knows how to get a hold of the pastor. Nobody knows where he's at. Understandably, right? His father passed away. But his father was 80. He had been sick for months. I could hear it in pastor's voice when he preached. Our pastor's lost a little boy. 
And they're here today pouring back into you. So when I say we got to get more excited, guys. How, how much more can you want from somebody? The nurses tried to get us out of the hallway. They told us, well, there's a garden upstairs. Maybe you guys should pray. I don't know who said it, but somebody looked at the nurse and said, if Gregory's not coming, we're not going. I was told if we didn't settle down, they were going to kick us out. I thought they were going to put us in a straight jacket and take us to Cutler. But through all this, I realized one thing. Paul speaks in, in the Bible, and he says, when I was a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things aside. And even though this injustice was done, church, it's time to put the childish things aside. It's time to put the things that in our own minds we've built up to be bigger than what they are. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so what the devil wants to do, he doesn't even really create the stronghold. He creates the mental process that builds the stronghold. That's what begins to happen. All of a sudden, we move the piano from one side of the platform to the other. You thought you should be preaching on Wednesday night. That, not that person. But all of a sudden, the stronghold begins to build in your mind. And that stronghold will keep you from what God has for you. And what Pastor Melissa is trying to say is, let's break the stronghold. Let's break this thing. The devil messed up. I know I was supposed to preach. I know I made a lot of mistakes. But he should have let me keep thinking as a child. Because Friday night, I wanted to walk out of that room so bad, I couldn't stand to see it. But something grabbed my heart and it said, do you remember the story of Moses? And they held up his arms, and as they held up his arms, the Israelites could win as long as his arms were held up. God told me, you gotta stay here and hold up Greg's arms. Stay in here and hold his arms. If I were you, I wouldn't leave this church. He needs you. He's got a mandate on his life that's bigger than any of us could imagine. But we got to hold up his arms. He's just a man at the end of the day. I've always loved and respected Greg. We had times when we didn't get along because we're family. I mean, let's just be honest about it. I think, I think Pastor did a great job of being honest with you guys today. But we don't know what we have here. I, there were times I wished I was in Columbus, Ohio. There were times I wished I was in Dallas, Texas with T.D. Jakes, and I was just hearing these dynamite preachers. But I'm telling you today, they don't have, and I'm not knocking these guys at all, but they do not have the character that Pastor Greg has. They do not have that. They do not have the integrity that Pastor Greg has. Not a shadow of a doubt in my mind. They don't have it. Not saying, I don't know anything bad about any other ministry, and even if I knew it, I wouldn't tell you. Because that's not my place. But I can tell you one thing. Unless the Lord build the house, the house will not stand. And the Lord has built this house, and he's put Pastor Greg above it. Guys, we got to go reach the nations now. We got to get a gymnasium up, and we got to get our voices heard. We have to stand tall to be seen, to speak loud, to be heard. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That God is good. That the Holy Spirit still moves. The cross still bleeds. Sins are still forgiven. Healing still happens. He raises the dead. He brings life. He clothes the naked. He feeds the hungry. God is still on the throne. Whatever's happening, he's still on the throne. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care you can look at me and say I'm crazy. How can you say that with what's going on? I can say it because God what was says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word said God is good. It said He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the morning star. He's Emmanuel. The devil took out an important part, but he, take, he didn't take out all of us. And maybe he should have. But unfortunately for him, he took the wrong route. He's got human air just like we got human air. And so I stand before you today to promise 
I'm doing this, and I, man, I might regret this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to regret it. But pastor's here. She's going to make sure it happens. That I'm going to walk with integrity. I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and mind. I'm going to try my best to be like Pastor Greg. And if I fall short of that, well, at least I'm falling short to Greg. <laughs> I can live with being beat by some people. But I will go after Gregory's vision with tenacity. A thousand will fall at my left hand and ten thousand at my right. This church will no longer be silent. This church will no longer take a back seat. We will not conform to the new kind of church, this cute church, this church that believes the Holy Spirit belongs in a corner somewhere, never to be let out. No, respect, no disrespect to that pastor that Melissa was talking about, but the children are supposed to bury the parents. That's the natural course of life. But you have pastors here that life has thrown them a heart-wrenching curve. But they take up their cross and they go. Just like Paul shaking off the serpent. Your pastors have shaken it off. I've never in my life met somebody that when somebody says something wrong against them, they just love you anyway. If you said something wrong against me, I'd block you from Facebook. I'd block your number. <laughs> I'd be done with you. But your pastors love you anyways. Think, Pastor Hap. Okay, so we're going to take the offering now. And <laughs> so do you have an anointing for a lot of money? Do you have the anointing for like a lot of money? Come on, man. Me? Yeah, I'm just asking. Lord, give it to me. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we're going to take the offering. And uh, so the envelopes are behind your seats. And if you're doing this for the gym, if you're giving to the gym fund, then write that um, on your check or on the envelope. And if you're doing it um, as your regular tithe and offering, then indicate that as well. So. Go. Yeah, do it. So we have the declaration. I'm going to oh, borrow okay. it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you have your bulletins, we um, have the declaration. Um, as we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, Benefits, sales, and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money that's paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. I love you all. I don't know. So lots of folks have asked um, if we're going to have any kind of service. And um, we don't know yet. We're not going to have a service here. Uh, my baby's favorite thing to do was fishing. And so, uh, Miss Rose, where are you, Miss Rose? First thing he wanted to do when he left the hospital was go to Miss Rose's and go fishing. And so, uh, we're all going to throw on some jeans, and we're going to go fishing at Rose's. And so that's the plan. Uh, so there'll be, you don't need to send flowers here, like, I love you. But if I see a stupid flower, I'm going to probably throw it somewhere. Just... Just let you know. Um, so, you know, if you want to do anything, just honor us and help us build a really big gym to save a lot of kids and do a lot of good. Uh, so on Facebook, there'll be information. It'll probably be Monday or Tuesday. We're just going to go fishing. So if you've got a pole and uh, a smile, 
you're allowed to come. That's the prerequisite. Bring a fishing pole. And uh, we're going to go fishing at Miss Rose's. She's been so kind and generous to uh, let us go. And then tonight is our church picnic. And this is what I need. I need you all swimming and having fun. Okay? I need you happy. That was pathetic. So I'll let you know on Facebook. Um, my uh, wonderful brother is going to be praying and saying some words at our fishing service. That's really weird, a fishing service, right? And uh, his, uh, our whole life, when we talk to our boys about being men of God, their daddy tells them, you will grow up to be a man of God with honor and integrity like your Uncle Steve. You will be a man of God like your Uncle Steve. And uh, so it's very fitting that their Uncle Steve uh, shows them the way how to be a great man of God. So we're going to be doing that, and you guys are, you know, anyone that's welcome to come, don't feel like you have to. We're just going to fish and have fun. And um, we love you all very, very much. And you mean the world to us. And uh, I thank you for everything. You guys have truly been amazing. Truly amazing. I mean, there's so many of you. I could go around the room again and again. I mean, Janet, your bread is like phenomenal. The lovely Miss Janet over there came to my house yesterday. And not only did she bring bread, but she baked it in my kitchen. So my whole house smelled like bread, which is really awesome. Oh, well, the cookies are forgotten. You know why? They're gone. There is not a crumb. There is not a crumb there. Today? Today you have more? No, you don't. You lied. You don't have them today. You just have the intent of more. <laughs> okay. Linda, if you don't know, Linda makes these cookies and Cindy. Okay, see, that's bad. It's only Cindy that makes the cookies. And then I just jacked it up and said Linda. But I know it's really Linda. But it was your recipe, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. But Linda, she, there's a running game if Linda makes the cookies better. Linda sifts her flour. Who thinks sifting makes the difference? I don't really know. I'm not a baker because I hate it. I can cook, but I'm not a baker. But all of you have just been phenomenal through this incredible, just stinking time. And uh, I just counted a privilege, truly a privilege and an honor that God has sent such fine men and women of God like you to stand with us and side by side and to reach the nations. So if you're a first time guest, this is probably a weird service for you. I apologize. We're usually a little more orderly than this, but maybe today you've known our hearts. So I just wanna thank you all. I love you deeply. And uh, Pastor Greg, uh, he literally hasn't had sleep in weeks, literally. So, uh, and he hasn't seen our children, our four children in weeks, because he hasn't been there. So today I told him, you stay home with your boys and wrestle and fight and play guys and do all that stuff. So that's what he's doing today. But he sends you his love. He loves you all so much and is so blessed by each and every one of you. And we just love you. And so in the days to come, don't come up and go, oh my God, I'm so sad. I'm so sorry for you. I want you to come to me and go, oh my God, I just snagged 50 bucks from this person to buy a gym. Okay? Okay? I just want you to be like, oh my gosh, I called a friend of a friend who's a friend of a millionaire, and I got like a hundred grand coming your way, okay? Don't be like, oh, are you okay? Are you all right? I am awesome, okay? So I love you all. We'll see you at the church picnic tonight, and have a happy day. Thank you for joining us in today's service. If you would like the opportunity to give, go to gatewayfamilychurch.com. Then click on the tab About Gateway. There you'll have the option to give online, where you can have your opportunity to give your tithes and offerings conveniently online. We would like to thank you for joining us in today's service. And if you would like more information, come check us out at gatewayfamilychurch.com.